Okay. Perfect. Um, Hi, Charlotte. Um, it's truly an honor to welcome you as our guest speaker for the AI Hackathon. You're a true inspiration and, an, and the embodiment of perseverance. Charlotte has faced many challenges along her journey, but she never gave up and made the most of all the resources at hand. In 2015, she moved to Boston to attend Harvard University for her master's in education while also raising four children at the same time. Kids, can you imagine your mom doing a master's, doing homework, cooking breakfast for you guys, and raising four of you all together? Seems impossible, right? But definitely not for her. She currently works as an AI architect at the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics, and her favorite part about school is getting to know all of the different students from across the state and her office, of course. She believes in aligning decisions with values and her initiative AI for Teachers reflects the same. A website dedicated to support the integration of AI into K-12 learning. She is so passionate about coding, AI and teaching. So why don't I let the expert take it over from here? Thank you so much for being here, Charlotte. Oh, and that was such a lovely introduction. Thank you so much. Um, I'm excited to share a little slideshow with you guys today if I'm able to do that. I'm, am I able to share my screen with you? You should be now. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Okay. I wanted to start with a picture. This is my daughter, Kaylin. And you can see in this picture, we built a robot together. And because she likes um, fun things. It has ears and we named it and it was a little rabbit that we helped to go through a path together. So um, I not only love coding myself, I love spending time with my own kids and, and I spend time with a lot of kids across my state of North Carolina and even further out in America. Um, so I'm thrilled to be here today with all of you and, and sharing um, across the world. That's very exciting for me. I was a programmer for 10 years. I've also been an educator for, gosh, about longer than that, actually, almost 15 years. I have started my own nonprofit. I have um, built new products that didn't exist in the world. And I think that although I'm a change maker, I'm much more interested in helping you guys make change. So I do believe that you can do that. I, I want to um, just share briefly about me that I came from a part of the city that was not very, didn't have a lot of money. Um, I didn't have anyone in my family who knew coding. My dad didn't even know how to read. And so if you have some family challenges that make it hard for you to imagine that you can do these things, it shouldn't stop you. It didn't stop me. So just um, keep trying, keep thinking and keep growing. So I'm going to show um, briefly like the kind of work that I do. This is the name of my program. I work at a high school, but it's a very weird high school. It, um, you test to get in and anyone who tests high enough and um, has an application for 11th and 12th grade, that's right before college for us, they can come um, to my school. I don't teach any of those kids. I only work in an outreach program that helps um, smaller schools and districts that don't have as many resources. And one of the initiatives that we thought was so important was to broaden understanding of AI in the world. So we wanted to make sure that we put AI in all of our different classes, not just a separate class or not just a separate computer science, but if we're teaching mathematics or science or humanities, we should be teaching computing tools with that too. Um, so one thing we did to make sure that that happens is to write uh, the, the fact that people need computer science and coding in our educational standards. And I'm mentioning this because this was a problem that I saw and my team saw, and so we did something about it. It's not that you have to go do this thing. You're gonna probably find a different type of problem. But in order to have kids actually learn this stuff, they have to be told by the government that that's what they should be taught. So that was the work that we did. And so we did it in lots of different ways. We've done it across the country by writing um, national standards. And then I was also a part of this organization called 
um, AI for K-12, and we decided the kinds of things that kids could learn about AI right from kindergarten, from five years old. And we said, gosh, you know, we can teach little kids about sensors. We can teach little kids about um, how AI um, learns from data. Those are things that you guys probably know about. And we were like, you know, we could teach little kids these small things that will help them to do more um, important work as they get older. So um, when you're thinking about your own projects, I don't know how far you've gotten in that. Are you very far along yet? You're just starting out? Just starting out, okay. So you can also think about one narrow slice of what you might do. So um, one thing, uh, I'll show you a couple of example projects, but you'll see they don't try to do everything. They don't try to cover every aspect of AI. They try to use it to solve a problem. Um, so I wrote some principles and then I've written some curriculum and this program here where you see the picture of me where it says I am AI, that's a program in North Carolina that's just for girls. And we wanted to in, in, encourage girls to participate in computer science where they might not have felt like that's a place for them, which is such a funny thing because when computer science started, it was all girls. Coding was considered a job for girls. And then when it started to be more technical and required, um, it, they were paid more, then it became a job in America more for boys. And now we're like, wow, you know what? Girls and boys can do this job. And we need everybody, every, every brain, to do this good work. And so that's why I wanted to just share some, some of the bigger um, efforts of putting AI in education. So that's my mission, AI in education. But I want you to think about it like how you want to solve a certain problem. Um, so one thing we've done is create formal courses for education. These are classes that would be taught in school. Um, we also have things like this where we come and visit um, students and talk to them. We have clubs, we have students who um, participate in competitions. We, and we um, built an app that um, identifies recycling. And now it's a good example of a project that students did that, um, that actually won a competition here from Samsung. We visit schools and bring tools and you'll see me over there. I'm, I'm teaching in that picture. Um, and we have summer camps, some of them are on Zoom and some of them are in person. Um, someone asked a question about COVID and, and teaching via Zoom is one of those things um, that it was, it was so nice because I love to teach in person, but when I teach on Zoom, I can talk to kids in Spain and I can talk to kids in California and I can talk to kids all around the world. And so I, I really love that I get to know more kids because of Zoom. And then um, I, I hosted a conference um, where we had talked with other great leaders that's similar to this. And this type of event was one type of way that we wanted to reach our mission. So sometimes it's an app and sometimes it's an event. Um, and so we also, I have a website, you can look it up, AI for Teachers. This is my main mission, AIforteachers.org. And we think that teachers need tools for learning, ways to teach, and um, this is modeled after the work that I did at Harvard. I worked for Scratch Education. Do you guys use Scratch? You guys use some Scratch? Yeah, okay, I'm seeing lots of nods. So I worked at Scratch Education and we realized that for Scratch, um, kids could learn it and do it, but they would have more chances of doing it in school if we helped their teachers to learn it and gave teachers support. So we modeled this website after the Scratch work that we did to make sure teachers had um, all the tools they needed to teach in the classroom. So these are some pictures of that website. And we did some fun things like, what does AI look like in our movies and our television? That's a great way to talk about AI. And um, so that's, that's just a little overview of um, what I do in my regular job. So I'm gonna share you a couple more things here. And uh, there's, plans. Oh, I have a YouTube channel. If you guys are YouTubers, NCSSM AI is me. Um, you can see me dress up like a llama in one of my videos. It's pretty fun. Um, I have teacher training and we have weekends for teachers. But most importantly, this is our goal. We want to reach 100,000 teachers and a million students. So we started with a little tiny idea of how could we teach people AI? And that was about two years ago. And then now we have this big goal. So we just started with an idea, no plan. 
And we thought about what people needed. And then we, we are now thinking about how to reach very broadly. And so your little small idea today, if you keep refining it and, and planning it, you can change it too. get a team together, have people that work with you. And that's why I wanted to show our partnerships. Our partnerships are people who want to do the same work that we do. So you don't have to do your project all alone. You need to find those people that want to do the same kind of work and work with them. Um, magazines might want to write about you or um, the people who write the software that you use might want to write about you. You might find those people who do the same work. We have corporate partners that we work with too and universities or other schools might want to work with you and share your work. And um, we have children's museums also that we work with. So there's lots of different ways that you can share your work once you've created it. And I'm one of those places, right? AI for teachers.org would, would probably like to share your project. So if you um, get in touch with me, I bet you can find, figure out how to do that from the website. Then, um, then we can uh, share your work too. So that's the first part of my presentation. And I'm just gonna um, switch here because I, I don't want to only show you uh, slides. I wanna talk about, I know you guys are, are talking about the sustainable development goals. Is that right? You guys wanna talk about that? All right, well, I'm gonna start in old school times, I'm gonna start with the Millennium Development Goals. So the Millennium Development Goals are from the early 2000s and here they are. So they there was an idea that we could end poverty and that we could do that by 2015. So this was a seven year goal and, and the idea was that we have enough resources in the world that we can help everybody. So with number one, for example, that there shouldn't be any extreme poverty and hunger. And you can see the result at the bottom here that over half of extreme poverty rates were cut since 1990. So now the goal is, can we end hunger everywhere? Same with uh, primary education, like everybody, boys and girls should be able to have access to primary education. I know that this is really difficult in certain parts of the world, but it's not everywhere yet. Um, so these are the older goals that have been improved upon. And when those goals came out, here's one. Uh, I'm gonna show you where to go. Here it is. Um, the Girl Scouts and Girl Guides of America um, created a program that was to support children about the Millennium Development Goals. And I was a troop leader at the time. And so I helped with um, teaching programs for children and they were implemented across 100 countries, 3.8 million girls and young women, only girls, this is only a number for girls who did these projects, not just to learn about, but to solve a problem in their area or community and to um, help make change in their area. So, so many um, girls and women participated. You can see um, 1 million are reached through this area. And um, so I wanted to just share that when these Millennium Development Goals came out, I saw some young girls who were from ages seven to 15, and we learned about these goals and then did something about it. Now at the time, we didn't have access to AI at 2008, that just wasn't something we had available to us. So we did some other things in our communities that didn't use technology. But now with our sustainable development goals, the same organization is saying, hey, we should make sure that we give every girl access to informal education like this program, where we help them become leaders and advocate for change and that we can help girls take action in the world. So there's other people just like you doing this work all around the world. And they're thinking about what problems are in the world. And we're trying to make sure that every child, not just every girl, but every child is healthy, thriving, safe and respected, and that you can develop skills and have opportunities that give you a great place to live and that you feel like you can raise your voice and be heard and make a change. So I want to share a, a, a um, slideshow that was created by Dr. Hal Abelson. He is uh, the creator of MIT App Inventor and he's a colleague of mine. So I 
do work with Hal. I know him. And he um, also created, you'll see there's this license here on the side, that Creative Commons license was created by him. So he's a really um, interesting, wonderful guy who thinks that students should have access to um, computa computational thinking tools and turn those tools into action. That's what you guys want to do. So let's see if we can advance this here. This is Seymour Papert. He uh, believed that in a program called constructionism, that students learn best by constructing and building things and that they can solve pr real problems. Seymour Papert worked with Hal Abelson, the man that you just saw, but he also worked with a man named Mitch Resnick, who um, he taught uh, and he has created the scratch language. So I'm gonna skip some of this wordy stuff. Um, but this is the work that they did. So Seymour Papert taught Mitch Resnick and they did things like in the 1970s, they taught little kids how to build computers that could draw things. So this big trash can looking thing is a drawing robot that's, that children programmed in 1970. That's crazy. Um, and so Hal Abelson worked with him. He worked with Mitch Resnick. Mitch Resnick taught a woman named Karen Brennan and Karen Brennan taught me. So I feel like these people are in some way related to me and my work is an example of their work. And now your work is an example of their work too, that you can put something into the world and you might not have the best tools. This was from 1982, right? You might not have the best tools yet, but if you start with something and you grow it, then it can be amazing. So um, the computer revolution is a revolution in the way we think and the way we express how we think, right? It makes the world different in some way. So here's Mitch Resnick. They've written, lots of people have written about it. And computational thinking is a, as a strategy for solving problems. If you're coding, you're using computational thinking ideas. Um, I'm gonna skip a little bit further. But computational thinking, the most important idea is to know what to make. Because if you make the wrong thing, you didn't solve a problem, right? So um, don't get caught up in all that coding stuff. You don't have to know all the coding things first. What you need first is an idea, a problem to solve. And then all that coding stuff will come along, right? All right, so we're gonna move from computational thinking, all those coding things to how do I solve a problem? How do I put this into action? And I'm gonna show you some examples. This is an app called Apapura and it is from Moldova. You see Moldova in between Romania and Ukraine. This is from some, some girls there. All these projects were created by girls and they saw that there was a problem in finding clean water. There were plenty of wells, but it wasn't always, um, it didn't always taste good. It didn't always smell good. Sometimes there might've been something gross in the water. And so this app that this girl created was able to allow people to place a pin on all of the local wells and, and rate them and also write a problem. Like at this well, the bucket is broken. So even if you go there, you can't, you can't get any water. And this app solved a problem in the community so people knew where to get water more effectively. This is another close up of that screen where you can see at the bottom, if you're a person, you don't have to be a programmer, you can just push the add well button and the well would appear on the map. And that way you could even take a picture and add that picture as part of the app. This app was created for free and it was available for free on the app store. It costs money to put it on the Apple store, but it's free on the, on the Google Play store or the other equivalents of that. Um, all right, let's see if I can go to the next screen. So this at computational action says children can create resources that na nations can adopt. Okay, here's another one. Do you guys know this place? This is India, Mumbai. And here is a Google uh, view map. You can see really up high from, from, the, from that area. And here, here is um, some housing. You can see the roofs very close together. Here it is, 
where are they? Here are tech girls. They, um, these are the, the girls and their mentor who were um, learning computers. And these are girls for change. Here they are. And um, this is what they said. We learned to make a mobile app using MIT App Inventor. The name of our app is Panny, which means water. The problem here was that collecting water can be challenging. And so the girls uh, were able to identify places where water was collected. And you can see even in a, a place that's in a poorest community, you can create a tool to improve the lives of people there. These kids did not have every nice computer. They did not have lots of resources, but they were able to make a change. Here's another one. This is um, a girl who built, uh, she saw that her grandparents were having trouble remembering. They were having trouble with daily tasks. And so she created a to-do list that helped them remember important daily tasks like taking medicine at the right time, brushing teeth, um, taking care of doctor's appointments and that kind of thing. And this is when she won the competition for, for this app. So that's what that is. And, and you can see that she thought about the problems that she had in her own family or her own community, and then thought about how she might make life better, not just for her own family, but for others who had those same kinds of problems. And then this is really interesting. This is, um, so people who are diabetic need to test their urine and their blood to, to see how, um, if they are doing the right things with eating and taking care of their body. But this is very expensive to have these test strips and to um, use the materials for them. So this one, you can take a picture with your phone instead of having the, the chemicals to do this all the time. And then um, you can see as a, as a diagnostic tool, you don't have to see a doctor. You can say, oh, this that person might have uh, a kidney disorder. If you get that result, send it to the clinic. So if you, you, you can't replace a doctor, but you can let people know, hey, maybe you should go see a doctor. Maybe you have a kidney problem or maybe you have diabetes. And we can test that almost for free on our phones before you have to pay the expense of a doctor. So here's a example of them using that in the clinic and testing it out. They worked with a partnership to make sure that this technology worked for the providers. They didn't do it alone. They worked with other people. And this was a lot, saved so much money that it was uh, applied, it can be applied worldwide. This technology allows any doctor to do this work. And when Zoom happened, medical appointments, this tool has been able to be helpful in that scenario made by kids. Okay, so you can see lots and lots of people use this platform to do this work. There's lots of kids like you that's happening in China. Um, it's, youth radio is another example. Um, this is national radio broadcast. It's not necessarily app or AI involved. Um, mental health is another one. You can do face sensing to um, see how people are feeling and then, and then give them feedback. That's facial recognition, that's AI. Um, you can ask, you can prompt people to write how they're feeling and you could use text recognition and respond to them like a chat bot. That's another type of AI. Um, you can view a summary. You can look for patterns in data. That's also AI. If you have an idea, if you collected a lot of data about this, you might be able to talk to people and, and say, I see a trend in your mood where um, other people have you know, maybe gotten outside or done some other ways to um, improve mood. If you see a trend in the data, that's another great use of AI. So there are lots of different ways um, that you might create a project to address an important issue. Um, mental health is one of those important issues. So I know that we focused a lot on uh, App Inventor because that's what Hale, uh, Hal's work is, but there are all kinds of tools that you can use that are uh, free and open and um, you can solve all kinds of problems, even your plans. So just wanted to show you all different types of things that you might think of. This one uses humidity sensors to take care of plants remotely and it'll it text you if, if your plant needs water or sun. Um, and using sensors is one other way that you can use uh, and involve AI in your project. 
Um, so there's, I'm still showing more and more. This is a concussion app for people who are playing football, American football, we use these helmets. Um, not soccer. My son is a soccer, we call it soccer. Uh, he's a soccer player, which is also a concern for concussions, but they don't wear helmets. So for American football, they wear a helmet and you can put a sensor inside the, the helmet and tell if someone may have had a concussion based on that information that's gathered. Um, so this is, um, this is just showing how that was made with coding and um, gosh, there's just so much you can make and do and to solve a problem and you can do it really simple. Um, you start with an empty screen and you can share, right? You hopefully you're working together in teams and you're giving people different parts of the work. People, um, this is an example of where one person is coding a button, another person is making the graphics and you're all working together as a team. It's not important um, how you break up the work. What's important is everybody does the same amount of work. So if you think about um, one person taking a half an hour job and one person taking two 15 minute jobs, then everybody is doing the same amount of work and um, everybody's getting to use their strengths to make your, your product the best that it can be. So this is showing um, one, you know, when you can see each other's work, um, you can work together and not have an argument about uh, small things, don't get caught up in that. Um, so this is a, an app that was created for students, a student who is blind and they use sensors to help people who are blind. Um, and this is a, a quote, no matter how old you are or what gender you are, as long as you have the imagination and the will to do it, anything is possible. Anything is possible. Okay, I wanna stop for just a second. I have a few more things to show you, but I would love to see if you have any questions. And you know about App Inventor, wonderful. Oh, so they do have uh, AI tools now. App Inventor didn't used to have AI tools, but they do now. You have to plug them in. There's a whole section on plugins for AI. Um, and that's uh, really cool that they've added those tools. For what I understand, it's one of the cheapest ways to do AI um, and it most, most accessible. YouTube channel is NCSSM AI, which I just put in the chat. Um, it's not a lot of videos because when COVID happened, I wasn't able to go to my office anymore. And so I stopped making those videos for a little bit, but I think in April we'll be able to make more. So if you, if you go over there and uh, sh follow us, then you should see more videos in April. I hope in April, maybe in May, we'll see. Okay, any, any more questions? before I keep going. I'm glad to see that you've used App Inventor. That's very nice. Okay. Let me talk a little bit about design thinking. Now, I know that you guys are doing where? Where do you find it? I'll help you find it. Um, I'll, I'll get a link in just a little bit. Who is my idol? Gosh, nobody's ever asked me that before. Team eight, and not Anaya. I hope I got that right. Anaya, who's my idol? Well, I don't. I don't think I have an idol for a person. I think I have an idol for my own values. I thought a lot about my values, and so I. Uh, my values are kindness, creativity, persistence. That means I don't quit. Don't quit. I keep trying. Um, joy and health. And when I think about what I might want to do, if I might want to, uh, this evening, do I want to go on a bike ride? Do I want to write a, a, read a book? Do I want to watch a movie? Do I want to uh, build something? Do I want to play with my kids? Do I want to eat a chocolate bar? Like if I'm thinking about what I want to do, I can think about that in terms of my values. So if I'm thinking about um, if I want to go on a bike ride, which I do today, I want to go on a bike ride, um, I might be thinking about my health. I might be thinking about how when I'm persistent at going every day, I get a lot better at that skill. And so for me, having one idol, one person, I think we all have to make our own way, right? We have to um, use our unique strengths and talents. And so if I tried to be just like one person, 
I might not do my best work, but if I know what I believe in, if I know my values that I want to go out and bike ride, but be kind to the people that I see, or if I want to go spend my time making something on my computer because that's creative for me, I'm not just going to watch a show, I'm going to make a show. Um, then, then I know if I'm on track, if I, if I get off track, it's because I didn't, if I didn't go with my values. All right. I'm going to help you with the AI. Um, can, how can AI facilitate research in medicine? Oh, that's so important. Um, one of my good friends worked on the human genome project. And that was where we tried to learn all about what was in the DNA of humans. And, um, that was hard work and it took a long time. And now he says he does work on um, really tough diseases for people like Huntington's disease or Parkinson's disease, diseases that happen in our brain, but that stop our body from moving the way we want it to. So he saw, he tries to find medicines and drugs that help us do that work. And they do that with computational modeling. They use computers for all of their work. You can't be in medicine, in research without using coding. And it's so important because it helps us to discover drugs thousands of times faster than we used to. So like ocean sponges are really resilient to all kinds of problems. And so the old way of doing research would be to send divers into the ocean and gather up sponges and take samples of, of them and then try different drugs on them. But then you need a diver and a boat and a, you have to gather all that material. And then once you've used it up, it's gone. But if you can model those com with computers, you can um, do that work much, much faster. Okay, I'm gonna hold, I'm, I will come back to the chat but I wanna show a few more things about how you do this work. And I know you have a whole session on design thinking, but I think it's worth um, talking about just for a minute while we're here together today. So this is the Stanford D School design thinking process. And if you go to their website, which you can see at the bottom, dschool.stanford.edu, they have lots and lots of resources, lots of things you can use to help you do this work. But the biggest thing you have to realize is that once you've thought about the type of thing that you want to solve, you can't just go solve it. You have to talk to the people who you're trying to help because what you think might not solve their problem. Like if I, if I try to tell you what to do, I might not understand where you live, I might not understand what you really need. I might not understand enough about you to solve your problem. So once you've thought of a problem, like my problem was, how do we get kids to learn about AI? I needed to actually talk to teachers. Even though I am a teacher, I am not the right person to talk about what I would need in an AI classroom because I already know all that, right? But the teachers that we need to teach they are nervous about computer science. They are scared of how they're gonna do that in their workday or how they're going to learn computer science when they didn't learn it in school. So when, when I first started out, I talked to the teachers and I said, tell me about your challenges in school. And you know what they said? They said, I feel like I'm, I'm worried that we might not prepare kids for the jobs of the future. They also told me about technical challenges. We don't have nice computers. Sometimes we don't have computers at all. Or how do we do this where I don't have to pay any money for software? So we found when we were developing programs that everything we made had to work on a Chromebook because that was the most popular computer in our area. So we didn't just say, let's go make lessons for kids, right? That didn't solve the problem. Actually what teachers needed were, were um, programs that worked on the software that they had and they needed to not feel scared. And then once we've decided uh, what, you know, we've thought about who we're, we're um, going to work for, then we can start defining 
you know, who are we actually serving? And we decided to focus on teachers mostly and not directly on students and solving their problems. And then we were able to ideate, that means think about ideas, right? Make the best um, decisions for those teachers. Then even after we had great ideas, we just tried things in the smallest way that we could with one person or two people, or we handed them things made out of cardboard. We didn't even give them anything on a computer, though sometimes you do, and say, hey, this is, we only want you to test this one part. See if you can make something fail in one day. It's going to fail. It's going to not work. Something's going to be wrong with it. And that's a good thing, because then you know how to improve it and what to do next. So you test things, and they don't work. And so you, you think about them again, you solve the problems that you've uh, created, and then you test it again. And you, you keep doing that cycle over and over and over. Keep going back to people, having them try your things. So if you're working on setting up your project right now, you might think about who you might wanna talk to about that and who might do your testing. Is finding people to test out your prototypes is um, something you could work on before you even have a project, is finding people who will test your things. It's best if it's not your parents. Like if you want your app to work for um, the elderly, you have to find the elderly. If you, if you want your app to work for um, teenagers, then you have to find teenagers. Um, so make sure you're, you test with people who are actually going to use your app. Um, and then I want to just, before I'm going to take a bunch of questions, I will, I promise, but I just want to remind you that you actually can change the world. That every person, every idol that you've ever had grew up a kid just like you and they made a difference. And a lot of times our difference, um, I'm not a celebrity, right? I'm, I'm just a just a mom uh, who has a job and um, I still make a big difference in the world. I know that I do. And so you can too. I don't want you to give up on that dream. Okay, so I'm gonna answer questions from the chat. Okay, I'm gonna, so if you have a question, put it in there. And I want you to remember that if you are a person who asks a lot of questions, then maybe just ask one, your best question. And if you're a quieter person who often sits back and doesn't ask a question, I want you to be brave, okay? Because remember, one of my values is kindness. So I won't be mean to you, I won't embarrass you. I want you to put in your question, even if you're usually very shy, because your question is important to me. Can you do that for me? You don't have to be a good speller. You don't have, I won't, I won't tell you if you spell a word wrong. Put your question in there if you ask them yet. That's really important. Okay. Okay. So uh, we got, let's see. If I could solve one problem in the whole world, what would it be and why? I think I would want there to be laws about AI that made our technology be for the benefit of all people. I would want us to make sure that our governments and our um, corporations made stuff that helps us. And when there is a risk that they put processes in place that keep us safe. Because I think sometimes technology has some issues, some problems that you guys were talking about with the previous speaker and that we can solve those problems with the right systems. Like if, we're, if we lose jobs to AI, then there should be a job creation program to help people fix that technology, right? We can solve that problem with policies. So I think that would be exciting to me. Um, let's see, Anya, what, what do I want to do with AI in the future? Um, so I, some, I think what I would like to do personally is I'd like to have more time to play because I think play with technology leads to some great stuff. And I feel like I do a lot of work right now. And so I would really like to just have some more time to play and think about things. And then I'd probably do a better job in my own work if I had a little bit more time to play. 
So if you're thinking about using tools too, sometimes just making time to create things that might just be trash is okay because you learn along that process too. Uh, let's see, what motivates me? Uh, I think kids may motivate me. I love students. I just love to see the stuff that you make. And it's just so exciting to see. I really want to see the projects that you make because um, you guys think of the world differently and that's a good thing. I'll give you a great example. I teach high schoolers right now and they're lovely people. And I asked them, I said, how many of you have a friend that you know only on the internet? I'll ask you guys this too. Do you guys have a friend that you know only on the internet? You've never met them in person? Any of you? Okay, you might be a, a few. Okay. Um, I think with my older kids, some of them are, you know, 18. So they're, they're a little bit older, but this is very common for them. They have like half of them have a friend that they've only met on the internet and they care about the same kinds of things. They talk about solving problems together. One of my college friends, he was on a phone call to talk about some environmental issues that he cared about. And his friends that care about that are all across the world. And they were having a meeting together to talk about how to solve those problems. And so I think um, what motivates me is to see technology help people solve problems and make relationships and um, find people who are like them. And it motivates me to help others have that same opportunity. What, who helps you get through the bad times? Um, I have a dog. So I pet my dog. I love my dog. Um, my family, I have, I have a husband and I have four children and I have friends. Um, they help me. And I think going outside it really helps me when I'm having a rough time and I just go for a walk or, or a bike ride. Um, I also like to drink coffee. Don't do that. <laughs> uh, that's funny. How do you spread software or hardware to rural areas where a lot of people don't have access to material things or electricity? This is a hard problem. And it's not only in, um, like it's not only in other countries, this is a problem in America too. I work in a lot of rural schools. They often have electricity, but they don't have high speed internet. And it's, it's a big problem of inequity where people don't have the same opportunity, even if they have the same good ideas and brain. So one way that we solve this problem is to create public good, like um, computers in libraries or in central areas that, um, where people can access them. And we make those in spaces where um, there is no, it's, and you can be anyone. So you can be a girl or a boy, you can be homeless here in America. There are people who are homeless and they can go into libraries and use a library computer to search for jobs. And they don't have to have their own of anything. So one thing is making places like that. The other is that we can teach computational thinking ideas without computers. And so one way that you could see that online is with CS Unplugged. Um, you can see ways that we teach computing so that if you work really hard in school and you go to university, even if you've never had a computer, you might um, still have the ideas for how to use one. Uh, what problem do I think AI can solve the most? I'm really excited for how AI can help in medicine in diagnosing problems like um, cancer. So the way it works now is a person gets a slide of some cells and they have to look at it in a microscope and they're experts so they know, oh, that's cancer, that's not cancer, right? But people are really bad at doing boring jobs over and over and over again. We're really bad at looking at 300 of the same thing day after day after day. So AI in sorting out the the slides that are definitely not cancer and only showing the ones that might be cancer to the expert will save a lot of people resources and it'll make sure we get more accurate diagnoses. So the uh, studies that I've seen so far show that AI is not as good as those experts, 
And those experts are pretty good, but they're not as good as AI plus expert. When you put those together, when you put people plus technology together, that's the best combination. And I think that's going to be true for a long time. So using AI to solve medical problems is, is uh, really exciting to me. The other exciting thing is we need AI in farming. It's so important. Right now, it's hard to find people that want to do the labor of picking the crops. It's hard to find um, people, uh, when you use an AI tractor, a tractor that's driven with AI, it knows exactly where it drives the first time. And then when it harvests, it doesn't drive over any of the crops. It stays in the straight lines and turns exactly as it did before and you get less waste. The other thing that AI does is water and fertilize exactly where it's needed. So there's not as much waste and the crops grow more evenly. So feeding the world is really exciting to me when we use technology. And we need, the average age of farmers right now is about 60, which is a big, big problem. So if you guys solve a problem with farming, um, that's really exciting work that can help feed the people in the world. Oh, let's see. Um, how hard did you find it to do the work at the same time as caring for your children? This is a big problem. Um, for places that have childcare, um, other countries that have childcare, um, it's easier. In America, we don't really have that. You have to pay for childcare or you have to, uh, you don't get time off when you're working, um, when you have a baby. So I did it uh, while I was a computer programmer. One reason I chose that career is I had a lot of flexibility in my time. So I didn't have to go from eight to five or some set hours. I was able to work when my children were napping or um, I often worked from 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. Um, after everybody was asleep and I was able to do my job around my kids. That doesn't mean I didn't ever use childcare, I did. But for me, um, I was able to find that time by sharing with other moms. And I actually think uh, it's very exciting to me if you have four to six mothers working together to share the work of the household and the, um, the childcare so that some of those other moms can tr be trained or to do work without disturbing the difficulties of culture, right? Like you can't change a whole country and how they think about mothers but what you can do is help mothers support each other to do the work that they do. And I think I'm probably unusual in that way in America in that I did not put my kids in a childcare center. I didn't, I was home with them and I worked um, and it was hard, but I, I and they don't need me much. My youngest one is almost 10. So now my kids are older and they're spending their own time doing the things that they like to do. Oh, how would I fix the misuse of AI? I think I kind of covered that. I think it's by laws, but the, you can't create laws unless people know about the problems. So you have to make sure that your older lawmakers who did not grow up with technology understand why it matters. That's the hardest thing. So share with your, the people you know that are older um, and, and share your excitement um, they don't want to be lectured at, but share the excitement of the work that you're doing. And um, that's a great way to have impact. Oh, let's see. What about AI going in the wrong hands? Is there something we can do about it? How, how can, yeah, this is a big concern, right? And the wrong hands is such a tricky word because I think there are a lot of good people who have their technology do things that they weren't expecting that end up being bad like Facebook. Facebook um, has shared um, hate groups and political ideas and misinformation. And that is not what they intended. They intended to connect people, right? But then there's this big unintended consequence. The same with facial recognition. We want it so that it'll unlock our phone or so that when we go to the grocery store, um, maybe it'll, it'll help us to identify products that we want when you go to Amazon or something. Um, maybe it knows what you want and it gives you, when we go to, when we get a t 
TV show and it gives us the right recommendation. Those are the things that we want it to do. But what does it mean when those companies have our data and they know so much about us that they can predict where we might go <laughs> at any time? So I think the hardest thing is figuring out what to do about the problems that we created on accident. And part of that is um, having companies feel responsible for the things that they make. And part of that is making laws to protect people. Um, and part of that is for you to grow up being a moral person who, who notices a problem and says something about it. It's really easy to let things go, especially if you're working for a company, but it's important to say when you have an ethical problem and how you might solve it, right? Like a good example is when um, companies did facial recognition and they used data sets from America. So in America, we have about 16% black faces and about 3% Asian faces. And if you train your data, with 16% black faces and 3% Asian faces, they're not accurate for Asian and black faces. So even though the people tried to make it the same as our country, it didn't work. They had to change it to add many more Asian faces and many more black faces so that the technology worked for everyone. And IBM was a company who recognized this was a problem and then they went and solved it. They made a mistake, but they fixed the mistake. And that's exciting to me to see that um, some of our biases are unintentional, but they can be solved when we um, put them in a technology. So I think that's exciting. How can we finish gender discrimination? Um, you girls are here and you're awesome. So keep doing that. Um, this is a generational problem. So you guys are going to grow up changing the world and you're going to raise your girls and you boys too are going to raise your girls to have the same opportunities that you have. So it's not just about raising up girls, but also saying what great boys we have and all the great work that you do and how um, when we both see the strengths of each other and we work together, that is where the magic happens. So I want great girls and strong boys, both, so that we can create the world that we wish to see. We do that individually, right? And we say something when we hear something that's wrong. Is the platform you use important? Python or Java better than block-based programming? Um, I mean, I think block-based programming is a great place to start. I love Python because of the libraries. I think Java's, I mean, it's fine. If you're going to be a coder, you probably have to learn Java, but Python is a great place to, to code because of the libraries and it's free and easy to use. Uh, sometimes I use C++ because I want to access hardware that uses that. So it just depends on what you want to build. You should not start with tool. You should start with the problem and figure out what tool you need. So don't start with the tool, start with the problem. And if Python is the thing that solves that problem, use Python. And if you can do it in App Inventor or if you can do it in C++, whatever. I have a friend who works on self-driving cars and he didn't have a programming language that worked for his problem. So he wrote a new one, it's called Waffle. So sometimes you have to solve your problem in a different kind of way. Can I send my apps to you through email? Um, that you have to talk to your, uh, your leaders about that. Um, they probably have a process for that. I am okay with talking to children about your projects, but I always have to make sure an adult is in the conversation. I never talk to a kid directly. That's a safety rule. So you should follow that safety rule and always have an adult in your conversation um, that you trust along with the person that you're reaching out to. Society has many views that after a female gets married and has kids, she cannot pursue a job such as coding, which takes a lot of time. This is a big issue, right? Marry the person who wants you to do that work. You can do it. Getting married, you don't have to get up, give up having a family, but you can delay and have an education before you do that so that you have the flexibility of working while balancing your family responsibilities. 
Okay, that's a great question. And if you have your education, you have that opportunity, but it's a lot harder to get your education after you have your family. So that's my advice to you is to get your education. Okay. And where do I see AI in 30 years? I do not want to guess because we'll be wrong. Did you see those pictures of that robot drawing things and it was this enormous trash can moving around? We're a long way from that. And I hope that it's solving more problems than we can imagine. Um, I do wanna share, uh, there's a website that's free and it's called um, theedge.org. I'm gonna bring it up here in, in a picture in just a minute. Um, and they ask a question every year about a big problem and um, they publish it in a book and they ask the most important influential people in the world about the question and they ask for their responses. So this is edge.org and the book, the question in 2015 that became a book was, what do you think about machines that think? And all of the people that wrote back are really important. They're um, historians, the vice president of engineering at Google, a writer, a, a professor of philosophy, um, someone from Harvard um, about law, right? Physics. So these are all really, really famous people. And if you click into them, you can read their essays. They're not very long. But the important thing here is that these are really smart, professional, influential people who have all different kinds of ideas about what AI might be. They don't know. They don't know either. Some of them think um, the robots are gonna take over the world and some of them think we're gonna live in a perfect world and it's probably something in between. It's probably that our technologies are as good or as bad as we make them. And so we have to decide what kind of world we want to be and make our technologies for that world. Oh, this was a wonderful conversation. Thank you all for asking such great questions. And um, I see I have one more question and I'm gonna take it because I have one minute. It says, automation is causing a major decrease in employment. Should we develop AI to increase productivity? Um, I think we should because I think we can give people different kinds of jobs or we can have enough resources if we use sustainable energy. Um, we can have enough resources that people don't have to work as much. Um, I think the kinds of jobs we're giving to AI right now are jobs that people don't want to do. And so if we get rid of trash, because our trucks are by uh, computers, um, we still have people managing those trucks and fixing those trucks. I think it's exciting to think about what how we might help people without enough education. And that's what I would love to do. Like, I wonder what my dad would have done. He drove a truck um, because he didn't read, like I said. So that was his job. And if AI took his job of driving trucks, what would he have done? And I think it's exciting to think about how we might have improved education enough that he would have had the skills to learn to read. And if we dedicated those resources to helping people like him, um, I think we'd have a better world. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Uh, Shikha, will you give me a uh, thank you, please? Uh, thank you so much, Charlotte. It was a really insightful session. I'm sure the kids learned a lot. Uh, you know, the importance of ideation, human-centered design, the different examples you gave them. They have so much inspiration to take, even for their current projects and just in life as well. So thank you so much. And also thank you for teaching them the importance of breaking stereotypes and that, you know, there's nothing... Uh, in this world that can stop you if you have if you're persistent and you have your mind to it so thank you so much it was really lovely to have you here yes can we also give my love back to charlotte the way she gave us right now everybody you can unmute yourselves now thank you thank you thank you, thank you. it was an amazing experience thank you thank you, thank you for amazing i really liked it Thank you. You guys Thank are great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. See you.
拜拜。